Once upon a time, there was a mountain that rose out of a vast green forest. And in the forest, there were birds and lakes and rocks and trees and rivers. The forest was also inhabited by a small group of people called the lizards. The lizards were simple people, and they had lived in the forest undisturbed for thousands of years in utter peace and tranquility. Once a year, when spring came and the first blossoms began to show, the lizards would gather at the base of the mountain to give thanks for all that they had. They thanked the birds, and they thanked the lakes, and they thanked the rocks, and the trees, and the rivers. But most importantly, they thanked Iculus. Iculus lived on top of the mountain, or at least everyone thought so, for no one had actually ever seen him. But they knew he existed, because they had the Helping Friendly Book. Iculus had given the Helping Friendly Book to the lizards thousands of years earlier as a gift. It contained all of the knowledge inherent in the universe, and had enabled the lizards to exist in harmony with nature for years. And so they lived, until one day a traveler arrived in Gamehenge. His name was Wilson, and he quickly became intrigued by the lizard's way of life. He asked if he could stay on and live in the forest, and the lizards, who had never seen an outsider, were happy to oblige. Wilson lived with the lizards for a few years, studying the ways of the Helping Friendly book, and all was well, until one morning, when they awoke and the book was gone, Wilson explained that he had hidden the book, knowing that the lizards had become dependent on it for survival. He declared himself king and enslaved the innocent people of Gamehenge. He cut down the trees and built a city, which he called Prussia, and in the center of the city he built a castle, and locked in the highest tower of the castle lay the helping friendly book out of the reach of the lizards forever. But our story begins in a different time, not in Gamehenge, but on a suburban street in Long Island, and our hero is no king sitting in a castle. He is a retired colonel, shaving in his bathroom. Colonel Forbin looked square in the mirror and dragged the blade across his cold, cream skin. He saw the tired little folds of flesh that lay in a heap beneath his eyes. Fifty-two years of obedient self-restraint, of hiding his tension behind a serene veil of composure. For fifty-two years he had piled it all on the back burner, and for fifty-two years it had boiled, frothing over in a turbulent storm inside of him. It had escaped through his eyes, reacting with the cigarette smoke and the fluorescent lights, and slowly accumulating into a sagging mass. He ran his dripping palm across the stubble on the nape of his neck and thought again about the door. He had discovered the door some months back on one of his ritualistic morning walks with his dog McGrupp. It had started out as a typical stroll, with McGrupp bounding joyously ahead of the pre preoccupied colonel. As they reached the apex of the hill, he saw it, and he knew it had always been there, and felt foolish for overlooking the door for so long. At first, he tried to ignore it, but he soon found that it was impossible. And slowly, his newly acquired knowledge transformed his dreary life into a prison from which there was only one escape. And on this morning, Colonel Forbin stepped through the door. Spring. The 
night grew very quiet as we stood there. He lifted up his visor and he turned to me and he began to sing. He said, I come from the land of darkness. I said, I come from the land of doom. He said, I come from the land of demons. I'm from the land of the big baboon. I thought I'd never, never go way back there. And I couldn't if I tried. Possess the ancient secrets of eternal joy and never-ending splendor. The trick was to surrender to the flow. We walked along beneath the moon. He led us through the bush till soon. We saw before our eyes a raging river. We can swim it if we try. And saying this, the night dove in, forgetting that his suit of arms would surely weigh him down, and so he sunk. And as his body disappeared before me, I bowed my head in silence and remembered all the thoughts that he had thought. He said, I come from the land of darkness. I said, I come from the land of doom. He said, I come from the I'm from the land of the big baboon But I never remember going back there And I couldn't if I tried Cause I come from the land of lizards And the lizards they have
Turn and Orban weren't alone. And suddenly, an unexpected movement caught his eye. On the far side of the river, he saw a shaggy creature standing in the weeds who stared across at Forbin with an unrelenting gaze. A gigantic mass of muscles and claws. The hideous beast reared back and hurled himself in the water and swam toward the region where Rutherford lay. And in a flash, the beast was gone. Underneath the surface to the frosty depths below, while Forbin, bewildered, waited alone. The seconds dragging by him seemed like hours, till finally the colonel felt it all had been a dream. Defeated, he bowed his head and turned to go. Suddenly, with a roar, the creature emerged before him and held the brave knight's body to the sky and the creature laid the night upon the shore and the colonel fell beside his friend in prayer that he'd survive and Rutherford brave Rutherford was alive were crouched over the soggy night, carefully removing his bulky helmet, when the colonel heard a sound behind him. He turned around and came face to face with an enormous, shaggy, horse-like creature, covered from head to tail with alternating blotches of brown and white. It was a two-toned multi-beast. And, at, and atop the multi-beast sat the most beautiful woman the colonel had ever seen. After 52 years of undaunted bachelorhood, the colonel felt a feeling rush over him that he had never felt before.
as they rode. Tila explained to him about Wilson and the Helping Friendly book. She told the colonel that she was part of a revolution to overthrow the evil king. The leader of the revolution was a wizard named Aaron Wolf, who was out to avenge the death of his son Roger. Roger, she said, had been executed by Wilson at the age of 14 on suspicion of treason. He had been abducted from his home and hung in the public square. The two rode on in silence deeper and deeper into the heart of the forest until they came to the outskirts of a small community. Teal explained to Forbin that they had reached the base of, of the revolutionaries. The colonel looked up and there in the center of the clearing stood Aaron Wolf. He was a small man, but his presence was overpowering. He seemed to emit a kind of violent energy that sent chills down the colonel's spine. And as the multi-beast moved towards him, he raised his fist in, in anger, and his voice filled the forest.
Moscow, in the main square in Prussia, the state of the revolution was taking another turn for the worst. A crowd of townspeople had gathered to witness the hanging of Wilson's accountant, Mr. Palmer. It seemed that Palmer had been a revolutionary himself and had been extorting Wilson's money to fund the revolution. Palmer stood on the scaffold with Wilson in the ACDC bag, an electrified robot hangman with a black bag over his head. Wilson seemed pleased as he began to speak. Mr. Palmer is concerned with a thousand dollar question. Just like Roger, he's a crazy little kid. I've got the time if you've got the inclination. So cheer up, Palmer. that night, news of Palmer's death had traveled back to the camp. Spirits were low, and Colonel Forbin felt devastated. Even though he had only been in Gamehenge for one day, he had already developed a deep hatred for Wilson. He wanted desperately to help the revolutionaries, but without Palmer, it seemed hopeless. He wandered slowly through the camp and passed Aaron Wolf sitting by the fire with Rutherford, who had returned that afternoon. He walked on and soon found himself outside of Teela's hut. Forbin knocked and walked in. Teela sat behind a makeshift desk in the center of, of a room that was littered with small cages containing spotted stripers, a tiny three-legged breed of animal. The unit monster sat in the corner. The colonel took a step toward Teela and spoke. I needed to come here tonight, he said, to tell you that I've fallen in love with you. He looked to her eyes for approval, 
but her face remained frozen in an expressionless stare. An awkward blanket of silence fell over the room and hung for a long moment, before being shattered by the sound of the door swinging violently open. It was Rutherford the Brave. The iron-clad knight rushed across the room and gripped the throats of Tila and the unit monster in each of his mighty hands. They struggled to break free, but even the unit monster was no match for Rutherford's power, and soon it was over. The bodies fell to the floor in a lifeless heap. Colonel Forbin stepped forward from where he stood in the corner, unable to contain his confusion and rage, and screamed, Why? His question was answered by Aaron Wolf, who had quietly slipped through the doorway during the confusion. She was a spy, he said and explained to Forbin that she had been sending information to Wilson using the spotted stripers as carriers. Roger's death had aroused his suspicion, and Palmer's had confirmed it. The colonel stood in silence in a world that had turned upside down so many times that he no longer knew which way was up. It had all seemed so simple when he first arrived. Good versus evil, and of course he had sided with good as he had done all of his life. And now, he stood and stared into the eyes of Aaron Wolf, and he saw evil. The entire picture began to seem like an enormous puzzle with one piece missing, and the colonel knew what that piece was. Within 24 hours, he said to Aaron Wolf, you will have the Helping Friendly book. And even as the words were leaving his lips, he found himself running out the door and into the forest, not towards Prussia, but toward the great mountain looming in the distance.
colonel lifted up his head and was driven to his knees by a blazing beam of light. And he saw the silhouette that stood before him. And he bowed in reverence, trembling in the shadow of the mighty legend's form. Nicholas the prophet stood before his eyes, looking down on Colonel Forbin, where he shuddered in the puddles and the muck. And he quietly addressed
the next morning at the camp, Aaron Wolf and Rutherford stood frozen in awe as the famous mockingbird flew out of the sky and laid the helping friendly book at their feet. The quest for the book had dragged on for so many years that its sudden appearance left the men staring in disbelief, unsure of what their next move should be. The shock wore off quickly though, and Aaron Wolf shot into high gear. He snatched up the book with one hand and the famous mockingbird with the other and began to inform Rutherford of his plan. He would first kill Wilson and then put the helping friendly book to work for him. With Rutherford's aid, he fastened the famous mockingbird to a pole with glue and rubber bands to ensure the secrecy of his mission and then set out to find the only man at Gamehenge who could handle the job of eliminating a king. stared at the 14 bars that stood at the end of the cell. He ran his hand across the cold, damp dungeon wall and thought again about the door. He had traveled through the door out of necessity. Once he knew it existed, he simply couldn't leave it alone. Just like Wilson. Just like Teela. Just like Aaron Wolf. And he sat in the dungeon and he realized that he was back again through the door through the tiny window in the corner of his cell, he heard the distant strains. below him. 
and he smiled. Right. 